First of all, I want to say thank you. It's always a privilege to come and share. I enjoy it. Um, this week, um, working, I stopped. I was doing a carpet in a tumble, and the um, lady's name, her last name was Staten. Not Satan, Staten. And uh, I asked her, I said, oh, when I was a little, little, little boy, let me rephrase it, when I was a young boy, um, I remember a pastor by that name. And she said, yeah, I think back great-grandfather or something was a pastor. Um, and then I said, it was in Burlington, and it was the Open Bible Church. She said, that's it. It was him because he pastored an open Bible church. I was sharing that in the first congregation, and, and the McGuire's came to me and said, do you know so-and-so at the open Bible church in Burlington? I said, yeah. Well, her parents evidently had sold State Farm Insurance to that person in Burlington, so it's kind of one of those things that's just like all of a sudden we're all related. <laughs> <You know. laughs> I enjoy coming and sharing with you and I appreciate your kindness um, and if I say anything that's offensive in this service I want you to know that you can reconcile that with the congregation that was at the early service <laughs> and the reason I say that is because they said amen I thought that was okay so I'm going to repeat it again for you <laughs> I'd like to read to you the gospel it's found in Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 36 through 48. <laughs> Luke 24, verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Does that sound familiar? Is that what you guys do here? Okay. Let's go on. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do, you, do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still did not believe it, because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I have told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in, the name, in, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now, just prior to this, two were on the road to Emmaus. And as they're walking, they're beginning to talk about all the things that happen. As we know, Easter is our celebration of the death of Christ, the burial, and the resurrection. This is the third Sunday of that Easter, the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. They're talking about, and then all of a sudden, somebody shows up. And he starts asking, now, I had a hat prepared, but I didn't want to muss up my hair this morning, so I didn't bring it. But I wanted to put my hat on, and I wanted to cock it to the side a little bit, and kind of give you an illustration that maybe the teens would more identify with. And I said, hey man, don't you know what's happening? Everybody in Jerusalem knows. I can't even get my fingers right. <laughs> but these two, as they responded to Jesus, one of them said, everyone in Jerusalem knows what went on. They've crucified this man, hung him on a cross. Don't you understand that? Not knowing they were talking to the one that had been crucified. 
And as he begins to explain with them and talk with them, he opens up their understanding. And as she shared this morning, he asked for something to eat. He had flesh and bones, a spiritual body. Now, folks, I want you to understand something this morning, and it's this. When we die, the only thing that dies on us is what? Our bodies. Our soul is eternal. We are eternal beings, and the only thing that's going to happen to us is eternally we will be separated from God only because of sin ruling in our life. Jesus was resurrected and given his glorious body, a body of flesh and bones, and he ate. So my assignment that I gave to the first, uh, first service, those in the first service, was this. This week, pull your Bible out, dust it off a little bit, and open it up and begin to do a search or at least begin to read and try to find some scriptures about this new heaven and this new earth. And I couldn't hear everything that was being said, but the new heaven and the new earth and our spiritual bodies. We're going to sit around the marriage supper with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but if I show up for supper, I want to eat. And Jesus said, this is the last meal I will partake of until what? Till we sit down around the marriage supper of the Lamb and commune with one another. And evidently he wanted to nibble on something, so he asked the, these disciples if he could have a little bit of a fish with them. Our spiritual bodies. The other question I want to ask you this morning, and that's this. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've had to learn as I attend church here, and I want you to know the reason that I continue to attend church here is because I enjoy the Word of God, and I want to be fed. My purpose in coming to this church on Sunday morning is to be fed, for someone to explain scriptures to me so that I can walk away saying, thank you, it was good to be in the house of God this morning because I had someone enlighten me on something from God's word that will help me, I'm sure, sometime during this week. Hello? Amen. <laughs> now I feel at home. One of the things, one thing that I've had to get used to is that <clears throat> you have, now, I don't know how, I, I, I learned something between the first service and the second service. So now that I'm aware of it, I'm kind of feeling somewhat a little bit guilty because I'm going to talk about it, but I think you'll forgive me. But one of the statements that you make during the service is, Peace be with you. You go around, you shake hands. Peace be with you, brother. Now, if you have ever shaken my hand, I've had, I, I've struggled with that a little bit because that was not what we used to say when we shook hands with one another. I would shake hands and say, "God bless you, brother. Lord's blessing on you." Something along that line. So it was kind of. Even though I've read in the scriptures, peace be with you, but I never really thought about it a whole lot. But you use that phrase. Last Sunday, we did the peace be with you at the end of the service. So I had a conversation with um, Phil. Phil. Your brother was here in service this morning. And wow, that, was, that was neat that he came after this surgery. And we need to be praying for him and continue to pray for him. And um, his name is Jim and your name is Phil. <laughs> and I kept twisting him around. But Phil was explaining to me some things last Sunday, and I thought, hmm. And then I was given the scriptures for the sermon today. Uh -huh. Hmm. Peace be with you. Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, peace be with you. Why? do you go around shaking hands and saying, peace be with you? Huh? Why do you do that? Is it just a ritual that Lutherans do? Is it just a ritual that you've been taught to do? What is the purpose of doing that? Well, could it be something in Matthew? It's called the Beatitudes. 
And what it says in the Beatitudes is that if you have ought against your brother, you make it right before you what? Come to the altar and lay your gift, offering, or partake of communion. Do we understand that? That's why we go and shake hands with one another and say, peace with peace be with you, but I'm not going to shake your hand. We got problems. <laughs> then why come to church? Church isn't going to change anything unless I want to be changed. Now, you already understand. I've shared this many times, but and we did it again this morning, and you do it in every service, and I appreciate that, is that if, let's take a time of reflection. If we have done something or failed in some way, let's think about that in a time of silence and pray before God. And that's the moment when I stand in the pew where I sit, I stand up with the congregation, and in that time of reflection, I go back and I say, Lord, purify my heart. Purify my heart, God. What well, doesn't matter where I'm at, it's that when the focus is on God, I want to be right before you. I want my heart to be right. Because I'm guarantee you folks, you cannot, and I, I know this, and I can prove it, you cannot come to church and be challenged to focus on your relationship with God and walk away from church with hardness in your heart, odd against a brother, and expect good things to happen during the week. You may have showed up for church. You may have come, but it's not benefiting you at all. You've wasted your time. Now, that might sound harsh, but the fact is, when we come, our focus is upon our relationship with God and with our Christian brothers and sisters, and we need to prime ourselves so that we can have a good relationship with each other on a, that horizontal, and a relationship with God in a vertical sense. Peace be with you. Before you go to the altar, make sure things are right with God and your brother. But then my next question, <clears throat> then my next question is, how are you handling the situations in your life during the week? Phil's brother, Jim, I'm finally going to get it straight, was here this morning, and that was great. But he's had a tremendous, tremendous uh, hurdle to go through. And no matter how strong you are, you need encouragement and you need strength. And you need, it's nothing else, just prayer in your prayer closet for God to minister on his behalf. But how are you handling the situations that you face in your daily walk with God? Are you mishandling them? Are you finding odd against your brother? Are you not able to shake someone's hand and say, hey, man, things are going okay? Um, I really have a hard time with people that just have that, that, that great big old smile every day. Hi, Steve, how are you? Things going good in your life? <laughs> Sometimes things aren't going well in my life. <laughs> and sometimes I can't respond on a positive way. But even though I may not have a smile on my face, and you do, maybe it's just a point of not grabbing me and, you know, <clears throat> as a Christian, you really should be smiling. Maybe it's that moment where you just, in your prayer closet, say, hey, God, I passed by Steve today, and he didn't have a smile on his face, and he hasn't had one all week. But somehow minister to him and help him understand that you are there with him. 
So when we face situations in our life, how are we handling them? How do we respond? Did you read Psalms 4 this morning? Anybody read Psalms 4? Oh, that's one of the scriptures. Yeah, we read that in church, didn't we? Do you, do, do, do you honestly know what was happening with David then? The first time you let me preach here, that was part of my message. Absalom was rebelling. David's son was rebelling against his father. You, you don't do that, do you? Ah, no, I knew you wouldn't. And how do you handle that situation? You make that bed, you'll have to lie in it, son. Yeah, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah, I'm not going to let you take my kingdom, uh-uh, boy, over my dead body. That's not what David did. David went before God, and we read it in Psalms 4, and he said, I'm under distress, but I know, God, you are able. I know, God, you are able to fulfill. Now, let's read. let me read to you verse, verse 1. David expressed his helplessness during this time. Yet David became greater man for the task that was ahead of him. Because he said, Lord, I trust in you. In verse 7, David testified to the joy of God in his soul. He says, I still have the joy of God in my soul. My soul is still right with God. There's a huge difference between the physical pain that we deal with and the spiritual liveliness of our soul. You know the devil... I know none of you know him, right? <laughs> but Lucifer can put us in corners and put us under situations that we just find almost unbelievable. And I often hear people say, how could a God of love let people like that suffer? It's really not the God of love that causes people to suffer. It's the evil one who has sinned from the very beginning. And he wants to destroy us in our physical bodies. Because if he destroys our physical body, what can he do to our spiritual being? Separate us from the kingdom of God. And see, the word of God says, don't be so concerned about the physical problems. Be more concerned about the spiritual onslaughts that Satan brings into our life. The other thing David tells us in Psalms 4, and that is, he said, we got to make things right between us, brother. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, David said, I can have a good night's sleep. I don't have to worry about what's going on with my son Absalom. I, in fact, David left the kingdom. And he told the people around him, he said, you know what? If God wants Absalom to have it, I guess that's the way it is. I'm not going to argue with God. I still believe God wants me to be the king of Israel, but God's got to do something about it. And David said in Psalms 4, he said, I sleep at night. My soul is right with God. Jim asked me this morning, how did you know that you were supposed to be in the ministry? I began to share with him a little bit about that. And then he, I said to him, but I didn't know I would be where I am at this moment. You see, I thought I would be pastoring a church that I had went at the very beginning and stayed for my entire life. 32 years I spent in Fairfield, and never once did I ever think that I would be where I'm at now. Not that where I'm at now is bad. I mean, I'm here at the Lutheran Church. But I had no idea. But the key was not where I'm physically at. The key is where am I spiritually? What is going on in my spiritual life? 
Now, I need to get I need to get going here because it's easy to get. That's why I have a few notes here just to keep me on track. The other scripture, and I, I'm going through all the readings this morning because I, I just think they're they're pretty important about about the the fact that Jesus appeared but to the disciples, and he let them touch and feel his physical body. And the idea that we need to make things right and we need to be able to, to, to have a good relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we need to make sure that church is a place that where we can renew our relationship with the Lord and with our brothers. In Acts the third chapter, that was the other one that we read, A man is healed, and this guy named Peter starts preaching. And he begins to talk to them, and he says to them, you are the ones who killed the author of life. You're the ones who killed him. Now, why did P Peter have the right to say that? What did Peter do just a few weeks earlier? He denied the Lord. Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me. Not once. Oh. Wow. And now the same guy standing up and saying, you were the ones who crucified him? You're the ones that hung him on the cross? He begins to talk to them and tell them about it. But he said, you know why it happened? It happened so that it could be fulfilled that our sins could be washed white as snow, that we could be once again children of God, that all the guilt, all the sin, all the stumbling, all the poor things that we fail, all the things we do in our life poorly, God overlooks. If... Anybody remember a guy by the, you probably don't remember it, but you may have heard it talked about, and that is a guy by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He was a great preacher. He preached a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the records from that sermon say that people, church was packed. And if I'm, the pulpit's that way, and I'm part of the congregation. The people were sitting in their pews, chairs, and they were holding on to the front chair, and they were literally shaking under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And some couldn't even wait for an altar call to be given and went to the front of the church and knelt, knelt, knelt down and cried out for God to forgive them. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. If you go through Scripture, you'll find out that there's a lot of Scriptures that says that God was angry. Anger. But you know what? We are made in the image of God, and God has emotions. But one of the interesting things that I've begun, I have begun to understand is, yes, there are times that I'm angry with my, my children. There are times that I'm angry with my very compassionate, loving, beautiful, wonderful <laughs> wife. Amen. <laughs> 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 But in the midst of being upset, that sounds a little bit better, what holds us together? Hmm? What holds us together? Love. Do you understand that God, as an emotional God, in spite of the anger that we cause, the frustration and all the other things, God so loved the world that he gave his son. God's love was so strong. They looked beyond the fact 
that his son, Jesus Christ, would have to come to this world in a human form and be crucified, buried. We cannot even begin to imagine the hurt and the pain and the loneliness when Jesus hung on the cross, what are one of the phrases that he uttered out? Anybody know? Oh, you're good Lutherans, yes. He cried out, God, why have you forsaken me? Not that he was separated from God. But in the physical body, he was carrying all that separation that you and I should have had from God. Remember earlier when Jesus and Luke, we read, we read that Jesus appeared to the disciples and they touched him. They saw him, flesh and bones, spiritual body. Jesus did not die spiritually. Hear that clearly, folks. He died physically. We are eternal souls. And the only thing that separates us from God is sin. And Jesus paid that price on Calvary that we could be children of God, His children. In spite of all the hurts and the pains, because Christ's sacrifice, we can come to God and be forgiven. Back to John, the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. Spurgeon preached this message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. What emotion overpowers all other emotions? Love. Love will do it. There was someone in Fairfield, Iowa, that really, really hurt me. This is confession time, okay? And uh, I really had a struggle between him and I. And he attended another church, and there was a time when many Christians got together, full gospel businessmen, and, and we got together, and they'd have breakfasts and stuff like that and, and from all different churches. And they had him, they had invited him to give his testimony. And they wanted me to come too because I was pastoring at that time. And Steve Higdon in the flesh said, uh -uh. No way. But God does. <laughs> I think you should. So I went. Short sight of the story was as I began to understand him sharing the way he was raised and his background and where he came from and where he was now. I walked away and I said, God, how short-sighted I was. How short-sighted I was to look at someone and be aggravated at them for actions, not understanding. It's not excusable, but it's beginning to understand. That's why when we shake hands with one another and say, peace be with you, that's what we really should be meaning, peace be with you. And if I'm struggling with you, I'm going to pray with you, not against you or say, Lord, give them what they need. No, I'm going to say, Lord, help me to see further beyond what I see and understand why they re react in the way they react. Does that make sense to you? Understand what I'm saying? I handed out some scriptures. I want us to read those scriptures. And let's start with 1 John 3, 1. People just don't understand why we gather here on Sundays. 
They don't understand why we share like we share. They don't understand why somebody goes to church and sits and listens to somebody give something and and go home and say, wow, what was all that? I'd rather go golfing or I'd rather do something else. They don't understand. Because why? They don't know God. When you know God, you want to change the way things are in your life. You want to be fed. You want to know him in a more personal way. The next scripture is 1 John 3, 5. simple as that folks he appeared so that he could we could understand he took away our sin i struggle i make mistakes but the reason i come before him is because he takes away my sin all right uh acts 319 Oh, don't you like to be refreshed? Is that why you take a shower or a bath? To get rid of all the stuff? Huh? Come on. Times of refreshing as the fellowship gathers together. Mm. Luke 24, 46 and 47. Read that again. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name, in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. There was a purpose to it, folks. There's a purpose to it. There's one more scripture. Who has it? Would you read it for us? It's First John. Three eight. He who commits sin is of the devil, and the devil has sinned from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That was left out of a reading this morning, and and Dennis pointed that out to me. And I said, well, "I'm trying to be a good Lutheran. I it wasn't there, so <laughs> I didn't include it." <laughs> Satan wants to destroy you, folks. He wants you destroyed. And Jesus showed up on the scene to destroy what? His works. He wants to set us free. Peace be with you. Wow. I don't know what it would be like. I don't want to know to walk away from the security of knowing Christ as my personal Savior. Because I see too many bad things happen. I see the way people respond sometimes. Even in the faculty of the Christian arena, where Christians can even find aught with one another. And it's Satan stirring up, trying to destroy the work of God. And each time we come and we focus on Christ, and he appears through our fellowship and love and mercy and grace that he has for us, the works of the devil are wiped out. We can be victorious. We can do what Christ has called us to do. Does any of this make sense to you? A few of you. We can have a third service if it... <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you so much. I appreciate all that you've allowed me to do. And I tell you, you've taken some serious steps when you allow me the privilege of sharing God's Word with you because... As I said to someone earlier, there's some things of the ministry I don't miss at all. 
I miss him not. The late calls at night, even though I get late calls at night, it's to get somebody out of water problems or a fire problem. <laughs> but I do miss the privilege of sharing the Word of God. And you've been so kind to me. Heavenly Father, again, I ask for this congregation to be successful. Successful because you died on Calvary for them. That not only for them, but as they share your word with others. I ask mighty God, that Lord, that each person if they struggle, will not be ashamed, but be willing to call out and say, God, here I am. Meet my need. Help me to understand. Because you paid the price. Thank you, Father. I ask for your blessings. I ask for your guidance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.